Hello, my name is Diego Leite. This presentation is about the Catholic Church cover-up of child sex abuse by its priests. The story was first released in 2002 by the Boston Globe, a newspaper in Boston. An investigative team of reporters of the Boston Globe called Spotlight had to investigate the Catholic Church and its priests for a year to put together all the crimes committed by priests and to prove that the Cardinal and the entire Catholic Church knew about it and did nothing. The teams need to have access to documents from the Church but needed to be careful when using the law to get them because the public would see as they were suing the Church and most of the new paper readers are Catholic or were Catholic back then. The reporters focused on lawyers who have or were working with victims abused by priests in Boston non-victims and insiders in the Catholic Church to get all the information they needed. Through the investigation, they realized that the problem is not only a couple of priests and a few victims, but the whole system, which covered up and did nothing to stop the abuse that was going on worldwide, not just in Boston. The team had enough material to prove abuse by several priests and cause an impact on society by informing people of a public safety issue and bringing justice to the victims as well. But they decided to wait to gather more information to publish the biggest story, the one that would not only expose abusive priests, but the systemic problem of the Catholic Church covering up Catholic priests who sexually abused minors. So here's one question for a situation like this. Is it ethical to hide crucial information from the public to deliver a more important on a more important one later on. The two courses of action within this dilemma have negative out outcome because if the newspaper wait to publish the bigger story, they risk increasing the number of victims when they could stop it. But if they they publish the story about the priests only, you would not be as impactful. You could have changed things in Boston, but everywhere else things wouldn't change. Marty Baron was the first uh, Globe's Jewish editor-in-chief in chief, and his first task for Spotlight was to investigate allegations against John Gigan, the priest first accused of molesting more than 80 boys, and the lawyer Mitchell Garabedian that has told that Cardinal Law knew what his priest did. Later on, they find out there wasn't just one priest that the abuses had been going on for a while. Uh, some people thought Baron would want to dig deeper into the story because of his agenda, because he's Jewish, he's not Catholic. But others can argue that an outsider or someone that was not raised Catholic was what the newspaper needed to take action against the Catholic Church. Here is one example of how having an outsider could have changed things for the newspaper. Years before Barron's arrival, Eric McLeish, a lawyer who represented hundreds of victims of sexual abuse by priests, sent a list of the priests accused of abuse by his clients to the Globe. Spotlight's editor, Walter Robinson, Catholic raised, saw the list and did nothing about it. Reporters' personal bias and lives affect their professional work, but I believe this case was covered by them without any agenda. In my opinion, they did a great job on exposing the criminals based on facts, not leaving any information behind, despite its sensitive content. The Spotlight team won a Pulitzer Prize for this reporting. The coverage is still unfolding since things like this keep happening and they keep finding out more about uh, similar crimes that happened in the past. But since the Globe released the story, other news, outlet, other news outlets exposed and still are exposing crimes committed by the Catholic Church. Since then, the church was always being watched by reporters, and whenever they find something, they denounce. Uh, last month, the Buffalo News published that Buffalo Diocese was hit with 900 abuse claims in bankruptcy court, more than any diocese. This month, BBC News published more information about the Catholic Church's child sexual abuse scandal. So the, the, the story never dies, it keeps coming. 
it's more and more that they find out over time. So they don't know exactly how many Ks there were or how many cases are because it's so many and they keep finding out over time. So for this story, Sesson's frame used was faulty system, in my opinion, uh, because under the faulty system frame, it is argued that the system is broken and unable to adequately prevent and fight crime, which is exactly what happened in the Catholic Church case when the criminal justice failed, uh, the criminal justice system failed to punish uh, the priests for these crimes that have been happening for over 50 years. So when reading about this case, I quickly thought about one of the criminological theories as well, the cultural transmission theory. In my opinion, this culture inside the Catholic Church grew over time because abusive priests would share attitudes, values, beliefs, and behavioral scripts with other priests. And that's, in my opinion, that's how it became a normal thing inside the Catholic Church. Especially because these priests that were committing these crimes would never pay for it, would never get actually caught. Uh, in fact, the Cardinal and the Catholic Church knew about these things, but instead of punishing them for this, they would just send them to another place, or they would say they are going, like, if, uh, it's a type of punish punishment, they would say that they were on a sick leave or something like this, instead of stating the truth. So, uh, I would like to play a quick clip now of Cardinal Law addressing the issue. Uh, it's not going to be long, I'm going to, the video is long, but I'm just going to show two minutes of the video. Let me turn my camera here. At the outset, I apologize once again to all those who have been sexually abused as minors by priests. Today, that apology is made in a special way with with heartfelt sorrow to those abused by John Gagan. There is no way for me to adequately describe the evil of such acts. All sexual abuse is morally abhorrent. Sexual abuse of minors is particularly abhorrent. Such abuse by clergy adds to the heinous nature of the acts. It affects a victim's relationship with the church. A child's ability to trust is shattered by such abuse and self-esteem is often damaged. Today, the issue of sexual abuse is a matter of open and public discussion. While this is often painful, it has allowed us to address the issue more directly. Only in this way can all of us be more alert to its dangers, protect potential victims, respond more effectively to those who have been the victims of abuse, and learn how to deal more effectively with those responsible for such abuse. Here in this archdiocese, I promulgated a policy to deal with the sexual abuse of minors by clergy. This went into effect on January 15th, 1993. That's Cardinal Law speaking, even though he knew about it, like Spotlight said like the Boston Globe say, even though he knew about the crimes, he was saying uh, they should have done something better about <laughs> all of this. <clears throat> so this is Law's first public response to the Spotlight team's investigation. He marked the first stop on a long trail that led to his resignation on December 13th of that year. That was 2002. Thank you so much for your time. That was my presentation. Have a great weekend.